Hello, I'm David Hilborn. I'm principal here at Morelands College in Christchurch. I'm standing in our wonderful chapel, part of our wider auditorium space in which we have conferences and exhibitions and lectures and all sorts of other activities, part very much of our community life here. Our vision at Morelands is to equip people passionate about Jesus Christ to impact the church and the world. And part of that is the weaving together of the spiritual, the practical, the academic, and the relational aspects of Christian education and Christian discipleship. And very much in that spirit, we're recording this series of videos looking at different dimensions of theological study. And in this film, I interview my colleague, Dr. Helen Morris, who lectures in New Testament for us on the shape and the content and the significance of the New Testament. We discuss why there is a New Testament as well as an Old and how they relate to each other, what kinds of literature make up the New Testament and what its significance is for our Christian walk with Christ today. So I hope you very, very much enjoy our discussion, Helen's and mine, and that it enriches and deepens your understanding, not only of the New Testament, but of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So Helen, among other things, you teach New Testament here at Moorlands. Um, the New Testament is linked to the Old Testament in the Bible. How are they linked? Why do we have an Old and a New Testament? Yes, great question and uh, quite a hard one, I think, to answer really succinctly. So I will perhaps talk a fair bit about this question. But I often encourage the students in thinking about any area of theology uh, to go back to Genesis 1 and 3, that everything that we think in terms of understanding about the Bible really needs to be rooted in those first chapters in the Bible. And in Genesis 1 and 2, you have this amazing picture of creation as God intended it to be. And within that, you have humanity created in God's image uh, and filled with the ruach of God. Now, of course, it's, ruach is a word you can translate in three different ways, breath, wind, or spirit. So it's a little bit uh, exegetically, it's impossible to be entirely sure, you know, which of those understandings of ruach is the most appropriate. But I've been really impacted by an article I read by Tony Lane, actually talking about Genesis 3, I'll come on to in a moment, where he talks about sin as distorted desire, sin as lust, the article is called. And he argues, although exegetically, it seems impossible to kind of really be firm that the Ruach here is talking about human beings being filled with God's spirit. Theologically, as you then read through the rest of scripture, it does seem that that is how God has created people to be, to be those who are in such intimate relationship with him, that they're filled with his spirit. Uh, and therefore understand his character, know how to live in ways that please him, know how to treat each other in a way that's loving and in accord with God's character and to treat creation in the way that God intended. And so I think that's a really important starting point for understanding scripture as a whole. And then Genesis 3 is really significant because there you see what went wrong, what becomes then the problem that the, the rest of the Bible is interested in uh, seeing what the answer uh, is to. And that's uh, significant, just the, the, I think the subtleties are, are often quite key. So what the serpent says is interesting, because he tests Eve's uh, trust in God's goodness. He sort of exaggerates God's command, a kind of, you know, is God really so mean and unreasonable? He sets all of these beautiful trees around you and he won't let you eat the fruit of any of them. Uh, she's, you know, wise to this and, oh no, it's just one tree, but you know, mustn't touch it, which is a bit of an exaggeration herself. And so kind of lured by the, the serpent, she eats of this fruit. And uh, I remember as a, a younger person just being really struck, why is it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's the problem? Because you think, surely a good thing to be able to discern good from evil. Why not just, you know, the tree of evil? I mean, that would obviously be something you, you know, you wouldn't want to participate in. But I think when you then read it in line of the serpent's testing of the sense of God's goodness, uh, the whole narrative, I think, is, is portraying a doubt that really God is good, really God is loving. And if you just stick with God, then actually things will be really good. You know, God cares for you. He's made this amazing creation for you to enjoy uh, and to, to steward amazing responsibility and privilege of being made in his image. But through eating of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, there, there's this distrust. You know, maybe God's keeping something from us. Maybe there's a good that's outside God that we could access if only we weren't, you know, uh, restricted in some way by God. And so you see in eating of this fruit, 
uh, this choosing of a goodness outside God. Of course, there is, you know, the God is good. Mm. He is love. So to choose goodness outside God is really to choose not goodness. It's to, to choose evil, really, because um, there's nothing that's good outside God. And so you see that then the, the tree of knowledge and good and evil does the opposite, really, of what it says on the tin, in a sense, that it distorts human beings' ability to discern good from evil. So you see, as you then go through the Old Testament, this distortion of what's good, human beings, they, they lose that. It's still made in God's image. So, and you still see God interact and you see uh, some men and women who do amazing things for God and you see certain individuals anointed with God's spirit and so on. But you also see humanity uh, consistently unable to really uh, be the image bearers that God intended them to be, to choose practices and, and ways that are corrupt and lead to destruction and, and hurt and pain rather than choosing the, the good that God had for them. Uh, and in God's interaction with people, one of the ways that he helps to guide people is through the giving of the law, for example, with the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, that reveals something of his character. It is intended to help the people to be distinct from the other nations. So, for example, to be more just than the other nations, to care for those that are poor and oppressed, to be holy in their relationships with one another, to display love and to worship God and so on. But it doesn't ever claim to kind of recreate the Garden of Eden or create the kind of new heavens and the new earth. There's a, there's a realism to it, as well as a, a kind of portraying of God's character and how you should live. Uh, and you also see that with the law, it, um, it doesn't quite work in the sense that people aren't able to keep it. And so a lot of uh, the historical books of the Bible are, uh, really record ways in which God's people fail to keep the law, fail to do the things. I mean, to the point where, you know, Josiah, it's found in Josiah's reign. And, you know, if they find it, you think, oh, gosh, you've really fallen away from this. You've not even got it. Uh, and that's when they're like, oh, wow, we've not been sticking to this. You know, things aren't going to go well for us and so on. Uh, but through that period, particularly through the prophets, you see this hope of a time. The language used by Jeremiah is new covenant. And I think that's a, a good term to then depict a lot of the, the Old Testament prophets that, that look forward in hope to this future point, even if they don't quite use that phrase. Uh, a new covenant, which uh, I think really harks back to Genesis 1 and 2 in Eden, where the law is written on your hearts, mm. where your heart of stone is taken out, given a heart of flesh, mm. filled with the spirit again. I think of Joel uh, chapter 2, the, the spirit being poured out on all people. It's an amazing promise. Uh, and so then when the New Testament comes along, of course, that's with the person of Jesus. We see that fulfilled, that it's Jesus who brings about the new covenant. Jesus, who through his sacrifice on the cross, his death, that paid the price for sin, also defeats the power of sin and death that can hold people captive and enables the outpouring of God's spirit. And that being really key, I think, for uh, understanding, again, the true nature of humanity, that to be filled with God's spirit is really to be living out God's image uh, and being empowered to walk in ways that God wants a person to walk. And uh, So for me, I think there's lots of continuity between the Old and New Testament, of course, the character of God, doesn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, human nature, you know, <laughs> does change with the filling, filling of the spirit. But, you know, you see consistently certain patterns uh, still remaining the same. Creation, obviously a theme that, that flows throughout. So lots of themes that th flow throughout, lots of aspects of continuity. But this big area of discontinuity in the New Covenant, this infilling of the Holy Spirit. With that, of course, we could talk about the uh, extending of God's people to those from all tongues, tribes, not, not the requirement to go through some of those specific ethnic requirements of circumcision and, uh, and so on. So these key aspects of discontinuity as well that come with the person and work of Jesus. It's worth saying, isn't it, that the Greek that's used and translated covenant can be translated testament as well, that the two things are intimately linked. The idea of the old covenant and the new covenant and the old testament and the new testament. That's, that's the case, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think because we've used the language of old testament, new testament, we can tend to not really think in those terms but absolutely another way of translating those two parts of scripture would like you say to be old covenant new covenant mm. uh, and that i think is is really the key difference so we have this uh, gap in time between the last writings of the old testament mm. and the first writings of the new testament and of course the new testament writings are focused very much on on jesus um one of the distinctions is that there's a different kind of literature that comes on stream with the New Testament, uh, the literature of Gospels and Epistles. Can you just say a bit about what a Gospel is and how that's somewhat distinct from what we find in the Old Testament? 
Yeah, I think one of my uh, highlights, I think, when I was working on my PhD was being able to go to a conference that was celebrating uh, Richard Burridge, a New mm. Testament scholar, mm. receiving the Ratzinger Prize for his work on the Gospels. And uh, it was, yeah, my, my supervisor actually was one of the people that was speaking at that, and he said, you know, we're here at this conference to celebrate Richard, who's managed to persuade people that the Gospels are writing about Jesus. And you sort of think, oh, brilliant, you know, hopefully, hopefully my, you know, eight-year-old niece going to Sunday school can sort of say, oh, the Gospels are about Jesus. It seems self-evident. Uh, but of course, in, in the context of New Testament scholarship, his argument that the Gospels, you know, really are about Jesus is actually very significant. Uh, there was a period in New Testament scholarship where it was... Uh, kind of more in vain, uh, in the vein of things to argue that the Gospels were really written to the person's church. They're really concerned with the issues of their churches, and so they're bringing in or perhaps even inventing certain things that Jesus might have said to address certain issues in, in their church. And Richard Burridge comes along and I think, you know, persuasively argues that actually in terms of genre, type of literature, the Gospels are ancient biography. Mm. Yes, as with many aspects of the, the biblical text, it takes that genre to new levels. Yeah. As a piece of literature, uh, the whole of scripture really is, is just stunning in the way that it, it develops language and can develop genre. So it, it's um, so slightly unprecedented in the extent to which it is a biography, but it is in that vein, it's in that, that genre. Uh, and so the Gospels are ultimately biography uh, about Jesus, about the person of Jesus and about the work of Jesus. And although, of course, new, you know, Old Testament characters you know, are significant and in places, you know, one, two, Samuel, you've got, you know, obviously Samuel, the, uh, the last judge and prophet, you know, he bears his name or the book of Ruth. Uh, there's no book in the Bible that I think in the same way is so focused on an individual character. It's the uniqueness of Jesus who the early church came to recognise as, as fully human and fully divine that stands apart from any character, any person that there'd been in history up until that point. And I think, uh, therefore, makes you know, the Gospels unique in, in their uh, exclusive focus on who this Jesus is and what it is that he is doing and has done. And then one of the Gospel writers, Luke, does a part two, which is the book of Acts, yeah. which is kind of historical narrative, mm -hmm. echoing some of those historical narratives in the Old mm -hmm. Testament. But then we find that there are a series of letters, mm -hmm. some of them written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, some written by other uh, characters. Um, uh, how are those letters different from the kind of letter that you might write today or I might write or email maybe um, and how are they similar? W what are the resonances mm. with today and what are the distinctions in what we call the epistles uh, section of the New Testament? Yeah I mean I think before we think about today again just I, th I just find this sort of fascinating the, the Bible as, as literature mm. to compare something like Paul's letters to the average letter that was written and yeah. just you know it's almost like getting the yellow pages through your door in terms of how much he wrote and yeah. the amount of investment that was involved in doing that uh, you know how, how significant that was in the day which I think does show uh, Paul's heart uh, and the other letter writers heart to to teach to communicate to build relationships with the churches that they'd been involved with um, and uh, wanting to ensure that those churches that had been planted uh, on the good news of what Jesus had done stayed firm to that message. Mm. So then thinking about today, I mean, of course, there's the inspiration of uh, scripture, mm. which is very significant. Uh, but I think as well, you know, somebody like Paul, he I think he's very aware of his role in really forming the early Christian church. He's somebody that uh, was a very, very well trained rabbi, steeped in the Old Testament. He does a lot of the really significant work of, of working out, you know, how do we understand the Old Testament uh, in light of what Jesus has done and who we believe that Jesus is. And so I think through his letters, he, he really does see himself as teaching, laying this foundation uh, in a way that, you know, I think if we were writing to one another, we might like to give each other, you know, advice. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, we might write theologically and bring correction if we mm -hmm. felt, you know, somebody was astray and what they were writing or so on but I don't think we would see, we wouldn't see ourselves as as having that foundational role in the way that I, you know I think Paul does see himself as as having and I know that you're a great fan of the book of Revelation the last book of the canonical scriptures um, and in fact we did a project just last week here yeah. at Morelands uh, reading through the whole of the bible together mm -hmm. Um, amazing uh, program of uh, people in a kind of relay team reading different parts of scripture right through and you ended it off with Revelation 
Um, that does have echoes of some of the literature in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. uh, so-called apocalyptic mm -hmm. literature, doesn't it, the book of Revelation? What's yeah. that about? Yeah, I mean, the book of Revelation uh, alludes to the Old Testament, I think, more than any other yeah. New Testament book. And certainly, yes, that uh, the apocalyptic sections of something like uh, Daniel or Zechariah, yeah. Mm. yeah, Revelation does pick up on. Um, I mean, Revelation is a complex book. I'd argue it's, it's a sort of combo of three genres in the sense that it is a letter, a circular yeah. letter to those seven churches in particular that are mentioned. And John very much presents himself in, in the line of Old Testament prophets. Mm. So he sees Revelation as a work of prophecy. But it does also have this uh, apocalyptic uh, style to it as well. And um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of work done. It's not the easiest genre to sort of nail down exactly mm. what it is. But it is a genre that's uh, known for having uh, just particularly interesting graphic images. It is concerned with the sovereignty of God, seeing God's plans and purposes outworked uh, in creation. And it does have a particular, often a particular focus on the, the end days, the sort of la latter days, you know, the cu culmination of history, what, what will happen then. So Revelation picks up on some of those. There's other certain features of having you know, angelic beings that speak and interact, uh, those sort of things. Um, but there's, you know, Richard Borkham's done some work arguing, yes, Revelation is apocalyptic. We would describe it in that genre, but they're a bit like how the Gospels take biography to a new level. Paul, I'd argue, takes letter writing to a new level. Revelation, I think, arguably takes apocalyptic to, to new levels as well as a, a genre of literature. So these 27 books, because there are 27 of them that make up the New Testament, um, obviously are quite diverse. But what are the common themes? If you were to pick out one or two of the common mm -hmm. theological threads through those 27 books, what would they be? Yeah. Well, the first one's sort of an obvious one, isn't it, in terms of Jesus? <laughs> the great <laughs> Sunday answer. school yeah, answer. Exactly. It's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Yeah. But, I mean, it yeah. does have to be, doesn't it? I mean, the Gospels, as I said, they are focused on Jesus and mm. who he is, what he's done. And then the, in the rest of the, the New Testament, they're really then trying to figure out well, you know, what now? What do we make of the Old Testament? So something like Revelation, mm. you know, John is not simply copying Old Testament. Mm. Uh, he, he's reinterpreting Old mm. Testament. So, I mean, just today in a Revelation class, we were looking at how, you know, the, the language of kingdom of priests, which in the Old Testament is used of Israel, is then used of those from every tongue, tribe, yeah. you know, people yeah. and nation. Yeah. Uh, and so he is, is reinterpreting Old Testament in, through the lens of who Jesus is and, and what Jesus has done. Paul, as I said earlier, is, is also trying to wrestle with, okay, well, what do we understand now about the covenant? Hmm. What is this new covenant? How has Jesus brought it to bear? How do we understand the role of Gentiles in the plans of God hmm. now that Jesus, you know, what do we make of these things of circumcision, the law? How do we understand these now that Jesus has come? So I think Jesus is the primary theme hmm. uh, in the New Testament. And then there's quite a few other significant themes. I think a couple that I would perhaps want to particularly highlight, I think one is, uh, is mission. Yeah. That throughout the Gospels, you see even in Jesus' ministry, a desire uh, for, for the kingdom of God to be proclaimed, mm -hmm. for the character of God to be revealed through Jesus' signs, through the, his interactions with people, healing, uh, exercising people from demons, so on. You mentioned the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Of course, mission, a huge theme there is those early Christians again take out that message of Jesus they want to proclaim it they want people to know about the forgiveness the grace that come through Jesus the reconciliation that there can be um, with God Paul's letters they, they, they are pastoral he's writing to established churches but still they're part of his overarching mission uh, which is recorded in the book of Acts going around planting churches wanting to see those churches grow. You know, mission is, uh, is not an individualistic thing in the mm -hmm. New Testament. It's yeah. communities yeah. of people who, who model what it looks like to be reconciled with God, or at least, you know, they're meant to. Of course, we're not perfect, are we, this side of Jesus' return, but uh, meant to be different, mm -hmm. countercultural in certain regards. And then even turning to the book of Revelation, strong emphasis on God's sovereignty, the victory of, of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. But you also see believers playing a role in that through their faithful witness. Revelation portrays believers as participating in this coming kingdom of God through through being those who faithfully represent what Jesus has done, who he is. So I think mission is another really key theme yes. through the New Testament. Uh, and then thirdly, I think another one I'd want to highlight is uh, what's often referred to as the kind of now, not yet. Yeah. Uh, that perhaps you could read the Old Testament and imagine God's kingdom in all its fullness would come in an instant. Uh, and yet what you see with Jesus is this now or not yet. The kingdom comes with Jesus. The gospel writers seem clear on that, that as he comes, he brings his kingdom. He proclaims the kingdom. There are signs of the kingdom. 
And yet you still see areas of sin, pain, mm. suffering, mm. weakness, brokenness. Uh, and so go back to the book of Revelation, that in particular really looks forward. You know, I love the, the last two chapters of Revelation 21, 22. Mm. Amazing picture, the new heavens and the new earth. There's you know, no more weeping, crying, mourning, pain, death. The old order of things mm. taken away. Uh, no need for the light of a lamp because uh, God, you know, God will be the lamp. The dwelling place of God has become the dwelling place of people. You know, all that amazing mm. language to depict the fullness of God's kingdom. Mm. And so this is in breaking of God's kingdom into the here and now in the New Testament, but also a, a sense of anticipation mm. that there's more to come, that the completion, the perfection of the kingdom awaits Jesus' return. And I think that is, you know, there's certain books, certain letters, for example, that might emphasize the now or the not yet more strongly. But that now and not yet, I think, is consistently through every New Testament book. So you've already alluded to scholars having dialogue on yeah. themes in the New Testament. If you were to pick out one or two key issues in scholarship mm -hmm. of the New Testament right now that are big, what would they be? Um, I think one that keeps coming back, and understandably I think importantly keeps coming back, is the historical reliability of the Gospels. Yeah. I think fundamentally, Christianity is a faith founded on historical events. Mm. What Jesus said, what he did, in particular his crucifixion, resurrection back to life.